First off, uh, we're going to introduce Mr. Keith David. Next up, we have the lovely Meg Foster. And finally, we have Mr. Roddy, Roddy Piper. You guys, I mean, wow. Did any of you guys go to the party last night? Oh, yeah? Well, you're away. later you couldn't find it anywhere <laughs> and that was that was before that was it was right before dvds and uh you know uh, or, or whatever the predecessor vcrs whatever came out so it was kind of weird that here we are the number one movie in the country and then nothing well and i talked to you know i ran into sandy at the uh farmer's market sandy must have been a treat you know what I'm saying? Right. Sandy, <laughs> Sandy was, one, was the, one of the producers. And she said, well, we must have pissed somebody off. Uh, and if you think about the, 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 you know, the themes of you know, subliminal messages, uh, money being you know, the ruling factor, and, you know, people worshiping money in, in that way, and things, uh, and you look at life today and how materialistic the world has become. Uh, it was kind of prophetic in that way. What do you think, Ron? Somebody's calling you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. You play the trumpet. Can you play the trumpet? No? Hi, I'm Rod, alcoholic and drug addict. Oh, wrong meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that, um, for Keith, I agree with Keith that we made somebody mad. Because it was all about Reaganomics. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's interesting, I uh, went on a man's show called Alex Jones. And I wasn't familiar with Alex, but he's a big conspiracy guy. And do uh, you know Alex, you guys? No? Yeah, I guess it's like he, he chases the Illuminati, and if, you know, allegedly. And uh, I went on his show, and there's another man named David Icke, who has nothing to do with show business, he's a scientist. And they use They Live as a template, just for like Cliff Notes, simply to tell you what's going on with yourselves and with us, and what society's doing in the new world order and all this great stuff. And I think that, uh, the fans themselves have kept the movie uh, contemporary because you realize what the government's doing. Um, I, I'm not, I just don't know which side's right. I, I don't know if the government's right in trying to make a new world order because there, there are aliens. They, we know this now. It's kind of interesting. Uh, if you look, in the, look up on the internet because everything's real there, um, <laughs> There's uh, the Prime Minister, excuse me, the Minister of Defense of Canada. He's in the cabinet and as he's giving his retirement speech, he says there's four different kinds of aliens here. So whatever you want to believe about that. Uh, the movie, I think, just by, you know, shot of the dice, I think it's coming true. I don't think it's a movie, I think it's a documentary. <laughs> He just didn't know it. <laughs> so, Ronnie, it said Carpenter saw your performance at WrestleMania 3 and wanted 
the cash you know, how did that all come about? Um, WrestleMania, th- <coughs> excuse me, WrestleMania 3 was uh, uh, oof, in the Pontiac Silverdome, and um, there was 93,000 people approximately. And I didn't know who John Carpenter was because I was uh, in the wrestling world, and that's a different world. Um, and Cindy Lauper's manager, Dave Wolf, wanted me to have dinner with him. And like, I was kind of busy with 93,000 people trying to stab my butt. <laughs> so, and Adrian Adonis, and Julian Mouth of the South Park, was a match I had. It was a very cool time. And John, that night, took me for dinner, and I, I didn't know. It was like, uh, pass some biscuits, you know, and, you know, <laughs> he brought some crystal champagne, I put orange juice in it. <laughs> you want to start the next movie? Sure, there's more roles over there. And that was it, you know, but he had told me about Meg and Keith, because John is very smart. Um, these people are real deal actors, I'm not. And they, he balanced it such that every time we see each other, we smile and just very warm. It's never been a sorry word between us. So the casting was perfect, and these fine actors and actresses were the ones that carried me. My job was to fight. And so I, without the three, I don't think the movie would have done so well. So Mike, how were you approached to do this? Um, I was given the script, and I went to meet John at his home, and Mr. Piper was there, and um, when I when I read the script, it scared me because it was so true. I mean, I, I feel that it's a, it's always been, and as Ronnie said, I never thought of it as a documentary, but you're absolutely right. But I mean, it, throughout history, it's always been, you know. Um, so anyway, I met Mr. Piper. We spoke about truth. Daughters. Daughters. Yes. Daughter number two had just arrived and was a different being than daughter number one. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then he just said, would you like to participate? And it was just so, working with John is just so simple and easy. It flows. You walk into the where you're changing your clothes and there's a, some flowers and it says, there's a little message and it says, when it stops being fun, we stop doing it. <laughs> so, rat, rat poison in my trailer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, he, he did cast the film extraordinarily because of these two gentlemen. Um, t- to me, they represent... I'm sorry. They represent anybody who stands up for anything that's unjust. You know, first responders, you know, um, all of us have that opportunity, you know. And um, in this situation, of course, it was, that's why the fight is so absolutely extraordinary because, I mean, you meet Roddy, he has on a, a, a wedding ring and he's just this man walking around looking for a job. I don't know if any of you were about in the 1980s, in the early 80s, but it was a desperate time. It was a desperate time. People were being let out of hospitals. There was no work. There was diseases everybody was turning their head away from. And then there you have Keith, who has two children in Michigan, and came all the way to LA to get up. I mean, it is life. It is real, real life. And um, the fight, to me, was epic. <laughs> Not only was it epic because of these two that really clobbered each other, but it's, it, it, to me, the, the fight had, um, just to use one other name, Sam Peckinpah in it. And only because Mr. Peckinpah had men fight that were friends, they had to fight before they could go and do what they had to do. And, and um, I'm a mom, I have a brother, I got some sons and grandsons. But I mean, it was when it came out, it was, I mean, when I saw the fight, it was, uh, this is what guys do and I fucking love them. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, girls don't do that. <laughs> girls do something else, nasty. <laughs> but, but guys just go, take that, take that. I'm throwing you, I'm throwing you. And then we get up and we go and do what we gotta do. And uh, it was like Wild Bunch or something. I mean, it was really, it was really great. So these are, these are the men. These are the boys. You're a queen. No, I'm not. I'm a ragamuffin. <laughs> so, Keith, uh, it was said that John wrote this role for you. When John called me, and he said, and, and it was the first time in, in, in the, anyone ever did this to me in the movies, uh, I wrote this part for you. If, if you wanted the part, as you read it. Let me know what you think. I'm like, huh? Really? <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and he wanted to, we wanted to make sure that he asked me if I thought it was cliche or something. Uh, and I was like, well, no. I mean, it, it just happened. I think around that time I was doing some some work a little bit with uh, the Homeless Foundation. And <clears throat> I met of a, a, a couple of extraordinary men who were like the working homeless. As I said, it was it was a it was a very particular time in our history in America, and there were a lot of people losing jobs that, that being let out of institutions who shouldn't have been let out because they couldn't afford to be there. And there was a lot of working homeless people, and that is people who just couldn't they they, they work but they couldn't afford the car and an apartment and at some place, I mean, they couldn't afford it. So they would, you know, one woman I met uh, was a professor at a university and she'd been married for many years and her husband divorced him for a, a younger woman. So she lived for six months in her station wagon and had to go to the gas station to wash up or in, 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 you know, get to school early and wash up before classes and things like that. And uh, so I was uh, painfully aware of, of, what, of the working homeless. So Frank rang very true to me. There are people who would find jobs out of state and send money home to support the family. Now that is also something that's, you know, I mean, that's going on since the Grapes of Wrath. You know, if you know that movie. I mean, so uh, it just rang very true to me. And, and then there was a book that came out around that time. I can't remember the name of it. Subliminal something. Or what it, what, it, what it was about was the use of subliminal messages in advertising. It's now illegal. But they used to, they used to like, you know, if you're in a the movie theater, every third frame there'd be a hot dog or, or popcorn. And your eye can't catch it, but your brain does. And it's subliminal advertising. And you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, you know, a, a, a big thing in the film. But, you know, I mean, now, now we know that because of, because of the, uh, the power of subliminal imagery, it's illegal, you can't do that. I mean, you can't, you know, go and advertise your car and whatever uh, while people are eating, you know, going to the theater to be entertained. That's just wrong. Uh, but in the movie, it was, it was very, very real. And again, when you deprive people of a means to live, like a man, you know, to, to live like a full human being, then uh, the, the focus shifts, and suddenly you can become very materialistic, very you know, um, you know, money being God, you know, and, and, and people, and, and you can be enticed to do things that are less than honorable because you just want to fuck, you want to, you want to stop living like that. We can get more political about that. So this is your second film with John Carpenter. Any major differences from the thing to they live and working with them? I think that uh, between the thing and 
uh, and they live, he was always very visual. I mean, a very visual guy, he knew exactly what he was. I think that he, I think that he became a better communicator with actors. Erotic can talk about that, yeah. But I thought he was uh, much clearer as far as, uh, like I said, being able to talk to actors and to get the result that he wanted, as opposed to just expecting the actor to have the result. He, he could then, he, he, he became better at being able to help them to get that. That would be my essence. So, Roddy, you were saying that music guys were the real actors and you were just there to fight. Now, you know, working at the WWF, WWE, cutting all the promos that you did, is it a natural progression to get into acting from, from being a wrestler? Um, no, it's like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> no kidding, like, they're totally opposite. Uh, wrestling is explosion, acting is implosion. And uh, it's, it was took a while to figure that one out. It's a lot of help. Uh, so, uh, no. Uh, there's one thing, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, there's one real strong statement that John, you know, the homeless people, real homeless people, but there was a one with, um, with Keith, and myself, and you had the skyline of America, and I think of the line was something like, I believe in America. You know, it's a very strong statement, but the carpenter wanted us to smoke a joint. <laughs> you know, and I said, no. <laughs> so we didn't. <laughs> but he did, as a, as a, you know, this is America. Uh, and, and that, you know, I believe in America. That's probably the most prolific part of the movie. It took me a while. That, but that's what he meant. Uh, yeah. So let's circle back to the fight real quick. It's become infamous. It's supposed to be, what, 20, 30 seconds long, and it ended up being over five minutes. They took some time off of that. <laughs> and that, and I, don't, I don't think it ever was meant to be two or three minutes long. He meant for it to be an epic fight, as I remember. He fashioned it after uh, there's a John Wayne movie called The Quiet Man, with uh, with John Wayne and Victor McLaughlin fighting through the whole town. Well, the fight was fashioned after that, and um, I think from both his point of view and Jeff Amada's point of view, I mean, I think what what makes the fight work so well is that there, it, and he kept stressing this. Uh, it, it's, it, there's a story in it. I mean. It's not just two guys fighting, they're fighting about something. And it gets, if it gets progressive as their, uh, I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the clashing of two rights. He, nobody's wrong here. He's right about his dance, he's right about his dance. And finally, uh, I don't know, fate, providence steps in to make, to make at least Frank, you know, you see what I'm saying? Now you see what I'm talking about. He says, ah, you know, you know, you know what I wanted to do. He didn't let me do it, and he did. We he shot it, but he cut it out. As right after, right after he put in the glasses, I turned to him and said, "Why did you tell me?" You know. I think I'm gonna try to borrow money. I'd still be there. It would have been great. Yeah. Why did you tell me? So, man, you got to have a little fight of your own when you smashed Roddy in the head with the bottle and, and threw him out the window. Tell me what that was like, being able to, you know, kick Roddy Piper's ass. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> it did. There was this bottle. I, I had forgotten this. Roddy mentioned it once. The bottle was made of sugar. Yeah. And, um... It felt like a real bottle. I mean, it had weight. And I, I went to clock him, and it wouldn't break. And I, I, I kept saying, are you sure this isn't real? You know, and of course it wasn't. They wouldn't let me do that. But, you know, and I, I'm strong. So, you know, but I couldn't get myself to do it. <laughs> I hit him and it broke. I was like, oh, you know, but I, I couldn't do that. I was so excited that it broke and it wasn't glass. But um, we had a great time. And then, um, yes, I, then we, there was the shove. And uh, the shove was rather mighty, very mighty of me. Um, 
But I think in the situation, there's a pretty big airbag out there. And, um... Did anybody guess by that time that she was going to turn on me? When you yeah. watched the movie? <laughs> me neither. Or me! <laughs> that was... Yeah. That was a horror. That was so that was shocking. A horror. Oh, it was. It was horrible. It started. It's no, I was walking up the stairs when we got to that. I was walking up the stairs and Roddy went up and he said, okay, Keith, you stop there, Meg. Pull out the gun and shoot him. I said, what? He said, this is where you shoot him. I said, with the gun? He said, with the gun. I said, just like, I said, how do I pull it? He's standing right there to me, but no, I want you to stand right there, pull out the gun, shoot him. It was horrifying. I mean, guns are wonderful, but it's, it's it, you know, for the right thing. After that scene, when you were shooting him, there was this, uh, this guy, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come to you. I don't mind it. If you do, please. Cut me off. With such beautiful eyes. Whoosh, baby Jesus. Uh, <laughs> um, so that, like, the end where pyrotechnics or whatever going on, and there's this guy. And all day he been, he's like, squibs you up with these explosions on you. All day how great he is, and whatever, you know. Just fuck me up with you. And there's like eight explosions, and like they're bullets, right? And they, and then, they squibs, thank you. And then, you know, I'm standing in the middle of fire and brimstone. Yeah, I'll stand there, no problem. He says, no, they're, they're gonna take him just a little bit, just do it. And so, boom, and you know, pop, 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 pop. And I thought to myself, yeah, he was right. He put them on backwards. He put them and they exploded into me. Dumbass, dumbass. Yeah, I thought that hurt. Oh, jeez. Ah, throw the fat, uh, throw the guy over. The roof. Get it. <laughs> he was a pain in the butt. So it's a pretty powerful ending for the film. You know, all the main characters are now deceased. Talk a little bit about that. It's, it's not normal for, you know, they actually reshot it. What was it? And the president of uh, Universal, uh, Pollock. They shot it, but they had to reshoot it so I didn't die. They wanted to kill me. For real. <laughs> the John Carpenter camp wasn't real happy with me. And uh, they had him reshoot it and uh, give him the bird so in case he wanted to do another one. They should probably still talk about it, but. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. So a little bit off topic for each of you for, uh, uh, from the film. What was your favorite Piper's Pit? Piper's Pit. What was your favorite? <laughs> My favorite Piper's Pit? Holy cow. That's a slow talk show I used to do. Um, I think uh, <laughs> the very first one. I, I made it up at a bar. Uh, I told Vince McMahon, you give me a bow tie five weeks at the mic stand, and if I don't get the job done, I'm out of there. Because they had so much great talent that was wrestling on TV, and I didn't want to wrestle on TV, because I wanted you to have to pay to see me wrestle. And I gave him this big speech in a bar in uh, uh, St. Louis. Well, you know, I was drinking, and I forgot about it. And a week later, I come in the TV, and there's those two chairs, like, you know, and I'm like, oh, geez, now I'm going to do it. And I didn't know who the guests were going to be. And I didn't, you know, didn't know what to do with this guy, <laughs> Frankie Williams, man. Wow. He's like the only Puerto Rican gentleman I know is Freckles. And <laughs> oh, he's great. And so to the second, I could give you my word, the cameras came on. I didn't know what I was coming to wall. What do I do? And, Hi, where are you from? <laughs> and Frankie Williams in the thickest Puerto Rican accent went, I'm up from Columbus, Ohio. We're rolling. <laughs> and uh, then he came like the alien and tried. He got really mad at me. And <laughs> I told him he was a lousy wrestler. But if it wasn't for Frankie Williams, God bless your soul, fighting me back that hard, it probably wouldn't work. So uh, he's responsible for it. He was a wonderful man. Uh, Meg, uh, you're growing up in the 80s. Uh, he man and Masters of Tell us about working on that film, Madison. Oh, the costume was very intense to put on and take off. It was very binding, and I couldn't bend. No, we had a wonderful time. 
We really did. It was, um, well, you, there can be a lot of people in a film, but then, you know, it's broken down. And um, I didn't have a whole lot of great big scenes, but you're sort of tippy-toeing about. So, um, I don't know. I just had a great time. I was um, very excited to do something that had to do with children. It was very wonderful to work with Miss Jill and Jella. And, um, and Gary Goddard was a really swell director, a swell guy. Um, and the lovely thing is, is too, is that it, uh, it was for children. I mean, the 80s, nothing, you know, nothing, there wasn't anything that you could do. Everything was heavy. There wasn't any light material yet, you know, there wasn't any, it was just like, it was there. Do you know, there was, it was, it was heavy. So, the cape weighed 35 pounds. <laughs> but it was beautiful, it was operatic. But you know, I mean, they make such light materials now. So, it's a little antique, but it was really great. We had a great time. And then one final question for me before we take it over to the audience. Uh, you worked with uh, the late great Patrick Swayze in the real house. Tell us a little bit about working with him. Uh, I had a job, so it was great. <laughs> the, 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 the best thing about Roadhouse for me is it went, uh, I went, I had, I had just moved to L.A. I, I don't remember, I think, I think Roadhouse was right after, I was recent, I was recent to L.A., so I think I did Bird first. Bird was my first movie here with Clint Eastwood, and then I think Roadhouse was soon after that, because it, 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 Roadhouse, Bird let me uh, get my first apartment. Roadhouse bought me my first car. <laughs> because I went from a four week gig to an 11 week gig. It just, it just was the job that wouldn't quit. It just kept going, kept going, kept going. Uh, and ultimately, um, uh, this is all, you know, I, I, I guess I, I joined a long list of uh, luminaries because. Uh, I said I was, in it, I was in it for 11 weeks. I had a very legitimate storyline where I was, uh, I, I, uh, I was an ex-Marine who I was looking for a job and stumbled into the roadhouse, which is kind of a rednecky place for me to work to begin with, but, uh, but I could fight and Patrick said, well, if you want a job, you know, this is what we, this is what, we, what happened was, um, <clears throat> I come into the bar and these two rednecks start hassling this one guy. I won't tell you what he said, but you know, he said some British uh, uh, sexist things to this girl sitting next to the guy. So the guy, they were about to have a fight. Patrick comes to break them up and one of the guys behind him pulls out a knife and I take him out. And then me and Terry Funk had a great fight. Uh, but. He called after you know you know you know when you when you do the film you have the rap party had a great rap party and two days after the rap party uh, Rowdy Harrington called me said listen Keith I got three and a half, I got three hours and fifteen minutes worth of film I got to cut it down to two ten so you got to go sorry so my whole storyline well, the only the only reason you saw me at all was because uh, at one point Ben Gazzara was you know, one of the main stars. Uh, I have to hand the phone to Patrick through, you know, and then it's standing at the bar. So you see me there, and you see me pass through like another scene. But I'm, you know, other than that, I'm not in the movie. But I still get paid for, and I still have fifth filling on a single card, and I still get my residuals. So <laughs> that's my roadhouse experience. <laughs> All right, so who has some questions for these guys? Ronnie? Hi. Uh, I think he's getting a little shy. Like okay. he, he, would, he would like to ask you a favor. Sure. Would you? Would you repeat a line? Well, this... It has something to do with 
CGI stuff. So we had to, you know, we had to do it. We had, we had to do it. A big special effect was. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the, the special effects would be, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at you. Okay. Amazon, you know, okay, we look at you for a few seconds. Cut. Okay, go get into makeup, or your double will get into makeup. We then turn the camera back on. So now we're looking at, you know, the image. We have, we have another. Keith, I'm sorry, I, I missed the thing panel yesterday, so this is a thing question. Um, I thought the ending of the movie was great, but know that some people wanted a more definitive answer. Did, uh, did, did you guys film anything that gave the movie more closure, or was, was that all it was filmed? Uh, again, you're taxing my 30-year-old memory. <laughs> uh, well, the, 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 the movie's 30 years old, I am. So, uh, I believe we shot, we, we did shoot it a couple of ways. I don't know how much difference it would have, would have made, you know, but uh, the last thing that I remember, I, I wasn't in. So that much I can tell you, it wasn't me. Uh, we both had time to turn into it. So that left the big question mark, and you know, at the time I thought, wow, this is room for sequel. You see how long that took. <laughs> and then it wasn't even a sequel. But um, as far as I was, you know, we, we if, as my last memory of it is we shot it as if it was neither one of us. And then I, you know, and then I think we did shoot a version where we were both suspicious because 
who, who would know, but the nature of the beast was, if, if it was me, I wouldn't know it until my life was there. And if it was him, the same thing. So, you know, is, is there a real difference, you know what I mean? Because the thing only revealed itself if its existence was threatened. So, neither one of us would know before we, you know, hell froze over. Because they weren't, no one, the chopper wasn't going to come to save us before we, uh, you know, disintegrated. Anybody else? Any other questions? Over there. Hey, uh, Roddy, um, WrestleMania 30s in just a couple of months. Are you going to be doing a Piper's Pit on that? Um, I'm going to be there. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, other than somehow I'm going to beat Hogan up. <laughs> Take the rest of his hair. <laughs> Ultimate Warrior says they're extensions. He would know. <laughs> Backing off. <laughs> yes, I'll be there. Yes, sir. Anybody else? One last one? No? All right, good. One last one. You know, I've been doing that show, announcing, you know, now just talking, talking, talking about all the, really the cool. history of WrestleMania. Yeah, he's, he's the vo voiceover, the history of WrestleMania. Yeah, I'm doing the voiceover on the, on the, well, on the wrestling yeah. channel. Really cool. WWE yeah. channel. This is a real quick one for each of you. Which was uh, your favorite scene from uh, the movie They Live? <laughs> I, I did like the scene. I did like the scene. Um, didn't we have to put on contact lenses? Uh, we'd put on the contact lenses, and then we'd go and we, you know, shoot up the hallway and stuff. Like that. <laughs> I loved all that. Well, because you know, I, I think at that time I hadn't gotten to shoot a lot of guns, so we got to shoot, to shoot those. Uh, but the, with the contacts we had to put on in order to see who the aliens were. Oh, that's <laughs> shooting guns. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you, know, you know, what, what the, the funny thing is, I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you do remember, uh, uh, some specifically, the mostly minor things, but you do have to remember this was 30 years ago. Okay. So, the, the you know, uh, I would have to ask some of these, I, you know, what did we do that day? I don't know. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't remember quite that specifically. You know, something has come. Something has come to you, and you know, I, and I'd have to see. The, I, I, you know, I don't. I don't even know when the last time I saw the movie, but I'd have to see it again. You know, one thing. That, you know, you know, a frequently asked question is, you know, how do you like watching yourself? I don't mind these days. I guess I'm. You know, I've done it enough now, so I can. I'm. I'm. I'm okay watching myself. Um, Unless, unless I think I'm making too many faces, or I don't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, but if I can remember what, if I can remember some semblance of what I think I was thinking at that time, then I'm okay. Sometimes I'll look and say, I don't know what the, I was thinking, because that didn't make any sense to me. But you know, you, we tend to be very critical of ourselves. one <laughs> scene. <laughs> There's one scene, like actors look at a, a script and they give their interpretation. And this gentleman, uh, I was in the alley and I was like, there was an alien up there, boom. And then this policeman come. And uh, I go, I level the shotgun at him. Then I see the glasses, he's a human being. So I said, beat your feet. So he went, no, run away. <laughs> He just ran on the spot for a long time, too. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. You still, you still seeing my hand there? Yes, I do. So that's probably good, huh? <laughs>
Roddy was showing me how to do a suplex. And um, then we had to do some move, you know, during the fight, you know, off the wall or something. And in the meantime, you know, now I was 25 to 30 pounds heavier than I am now. Roddy was the strongest guy I've ever seen in my life. I mean, pound for pound, he was two. And then he, I think he, he, he was he went from two eighty to two forty. He lost forty pounds to do the movie. He was two hundred and forty pounds of solid steel. And so there was a moment in between, and he's holding me up like this, like a baby. And he goes, and John, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, let's give it up for... Ladies and gentlemen, Jason, get around. Put your hands together for Mr. Michael Exler from the East Coast Horror Group.